right into the mic too. Yep, we're working on that. Okay. All right, so since we are Facebook living this and recording this, we want to make it seem as though the entire city of Canton is here tonight. And we're doing pretty pretty well with that actually. So uh, when I count down from three, you're gonna clap and cheer like the whole city of Canton is in fact here and you are that entire volume. You got that? Yes. All right, three. Two. Is Azure ready to start recording? It's already recording. Oh, it is already recording. Okay. Three, two, one. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, people and persons, beings of all ages, welcome to Writing Night's Board Fight. For the uninitiated, picture a poetry slam mixed with a rap battle, mixed with a comedy act, mixed with a storytelling set, mixed with a UFC fight, mixed with a WWE show, and you get the idea that's a lot of mixing. Call it ultimate writing or mixed literary arts. What you are about to see is a head-to-head -head battle of wits and words with a bit of trash talk sprinkled in. We take two fighters, put them into a three-round competition. Round one, two minutes each. Round two, three minutes each. Round three, four minutes each. Fighters. You can, uh, fighters can squeeze as many pieces into their round. For example, if they can squeeze 80 haiku into two minutes, go for it. I'd like to see if we can actually understand any of the words if you're talking that fast. However, there is no grace period. When time is up, fighters must stop or they are disqualified. You will hear a knocking sound, a clapping sound, at 10 seconds to go in the round. <laughs> Rounds are judged on a 10 point must system. The winner gets 10 points, they, they must get 10 points, that's why it's a must system. And the loser gets 10 or 9 points or less. Uh, second place, second place gets 9 points or less. Judges are asked to judge on six main qualities. Clarity of speech, efficient use of time, passion, word choice, impact, and originality. A sixth quality the judges should apply to themselves is consistency. If you judge one fighter on a certain quality, please use the same rubric with the other fighter. While the sword fight programs ask the fighters to portray characters, all scores are legitimate and contribute to Writing Knight's uh, sword fight persistent and ever progressing storyline. So we're going to have like a, a championship of the champions at some point too, and we'll hear more about that soon. But I wanted to point out next the Writing Knight's Patreon. All right, so Patreon is a way for you to be a patron of the arts. <laughs> It's the perfect way to get all of the Writing Nights upcoming and past books every month without worrying about paying for them piecemeal. And it's a great way to show support for the product so we can pay, we can pay folks our monthly features and sword fighters. All right, so we have three judges this evening who happen to all be sitting over here. We did not intentionally segregate them, that's just how it happened. So. We have a returning judge from last month. Black Rain, did you want to say anything about yourself? Thank you very much, Black Rain. Charlotte is a new judge this evening. Charlotte, do you want to say anything about yourself? All right. 
right. And our third judge is also a brand new judge, Carl. Do you want to say anything about yourself? Thank you. Give it up for our judges. Woo! Woo! All right. So we have two competitors this evening. It says in this corner, but just in this general direction, we have a local teenager who believes pain is the muse of poetry. Her name is Francesca Faluca. And who will be sitting over here, our other competitor, um, with honest imagery and intricate, yeah, I can talk today, <laughs> intricate metaphors, is Kristen Wurstler. Guess what? I actually have a coin to flip. Holy shit, a coin. All right, we're going to flip a coin to determine who goes first in the first round. Whoever loses the coin flip goes first in round two. Which of you would like to call a coin flip? Okay. Right. Heads are lucky. <laughs> uh, it is heads. <laughs> so, Francesca goes... Well, first. You, you, you decide, yeah, okay. Well, whatever. So you decide whether you want to go first or second, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. So you're going first in this round, and then Kristen will be going first in the second round. Alright, so we can adjust this too. It's kind of probably a little high up. Alright, so feel free to adjust this if you choose to use it. Alright, so first on the mic, Francesca! Don't start yet. I will give you a countdown from 5 to 0, or 5 to 0, mm -hmm. one of you, and then you. All right, remember to get right on the mic, like almost <laughs> eating the mic. All right, five, four, three, two, one. He is poetry. The way he cares, he cares more about me than I care about myself. He says, take my hand and look to me. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, he begged us, Look to me and be ye saved, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. We stared at him as he told us our fate. We even watched him on tape, and our hands have handled. We shook his hand and said, it's so nice to see you. Not knowing who we were talking to, at least I didn't know who I was talking to, of the word of life. He is poetry, and the way he cares, the way he walks, and who he is. Standing in the ocean, taking in her vast beauty, bobbing up and down with the waves, releasing my body, the waves take a hold. The sky met the sea, the two touched and held hands and became one, a picture of perfect beauty. Frightened by her beauty, a wave of panic crashes into my mind, the ocean so vast and wide. I'm minuscule to the sea, no ending, I can see how easy it could be to slip away into oblivion, holding by the tide, thrashed around, no sight or sound. Life's mark washed away, vanish no return. Life so easily given, equally taken away. when there's a voice actually on the microphone. Um, I should, oh, another thing I should mention is that if you are not a competitor this evening and you're not a judge, then we do ask for $5 from each person so that we can afford to pay the performers. Um, another way of contributing to writing nights is by contributing 10 used books instead of $5. So that is another way that you can support us. 
I don't know. Is everybody able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. People are saying that they can. All right. Um, however, if you do not have five dollars and you do not have any used books to contribute, that is fine. We are glad that you are here. Um, but for those who do have the means to contribute, we definitely would like you to do so. All right. I think we're ready to go on with the uh, second half of the first round. So please welcome to the microphone, Kristen Wersler. <laughs> my Spongebob t-shirt, whose hair always smelled like cigarette smoke, like it had been burnt with a flat iron, got pregnant. In our freshman world history class, we had a student teacher from the local college, and he had full lips and warm eyes, so in a too tight camisole, the chubby girl leaned forward and whispered in my ear, God, wouldn't you love to be taken by him? Because she knew I had no idea, really, what that meant. In the creek under the Ohio 153 bridge, kids would smoke bad pot and carve their names into the crumbling cement in the day. Haley and I cut away chunks of stone. The chubby girl stormed down the muddy incline with clenched fists and clenched teeth and snapped, I've heard you've been talking shit. Black eyeliner coated Sarah's eyes, cut the anger like an acid storm, burning skin. I'm sorry, who are you? Haley's eyes were squinted, head tilted. Don't fucking play with me or I'll rip that ugly nose set out of your fucking face. Sarah yanked back her arm, turned her fist into stone, but Haley was faster and grabbed Sarah's cigarette hair, bringing it to the ground, her Chuck Taylors into the chubby girl's stomach. A few years later, the boy working the Burger King drive through the one who broke up the fight at the bridge, told me Sarah's still fuckable, even with the stretch marks. Every day I drive over the bridge on my way to work. Our pocket knife was too dull, so the wind washed away our names, but I think hers might still be there. Once, out of nowhere, she shoved my back into the cold, piercing metal lockers and screamed, God, don't you fucking get it? Even though she knew I had no idea, really, what that meant. In the Facebook pictures of her giving birth, her eyeliner streaked down her cheeks, transparent black lines racing down her face like the mud under the Ohio 153 bridge, and I can't see her pictures without seeing her face and squished into the muddy earth, her wild eyes burning into mine as I stood above her, hands trembling because long Time. after Haley and I... Time. kitchen sink burst. Water mixed with your mom's stuffing and residue of baklava unhinged the PVC towers, an alligator opening its jaw tooth by tooth. Your head dipped back onto your neck and you laughed in the sprinkler soaking your khakis. Your uncle came and assessed the damage. When he pulled the brass roots from the sink, he handed me the curved trap and from it fell your mom's engagement ring she lost four years ago. You said she had forgotten all about it, but 
She said she had forgotten all about it, but when I held it out in my palm, she cried and gripped my wrist, her unburied treasure. We spent half a summer and most of my paychecks from the grocery store at the Commons Community Pool. We made out in the tunnel slide of the playground built for all the kids too afraid of the water. I never liked wearing a bathing suit around you anyway. You pinch the rolls gathering at my stomach and say, my mom was skinny once too. My thighs prickled red against the cement when I kicked my legs in the shallow water. I kept your beach towel over my lap as you swam to the deep end. My fingers ran through the marks stretched out like rivers along my hips. On the way home, I asked you about the girl in the red suit, the one who can do a backflip off the highest diving board. When she broke the surface again, you reached for her hand and pulled her to the ladder. You bought her a Pepsi from the concession stand. The edges of your smile lifted red cheeks. You said I should be honored. I'm the girl who memorizes his grandma's favorite fried chicken recipe. She's the girl with the monthly subscription to the tanning salon. Her beauty washes off in the shower, but I can't brush your bruises from my skin for weeks. I try to talk about how hard it is for a scathing heat to battle an entire ocean of chlorine, a perfect pH balance, but you beg me to forget all about her. I learned to swim in that water we pushed under the bridge. Brown sewage pumped out of the culvert, a steady stream, a murky surface budding past my ears until all I knew to do was survive. My lungs sprouted gills, but every bone holding me together snapped like coral, like your uncle's fishing line the time a female needlefish flung herself from the water, ratched, latched on with the razors in her mouth. His arms made of rubber flailed. I thought the snap was a shotgun in the distance, but between his calloused fingers that looked like yours rested a great line. Your uncle cursed at the sky, yelled about how good her flesh would have tasted fried. You sat with the empty cooler on your lap. When your bone dry stare met mine, I realized you probably liked me served the same way. The coal felt stiff in my hands. I drove home in silence. I will find the needlefish you could not conquer. 10 seconds. I will swim with her. Thank you. Ooh. Hey, Prue. <laughs> All right. Kristen, how do you think you are doing? Oh, my heart is pounding so fast, I don't think I can think properly, but I think it's going well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's also a completely fair statement. Yay. <laughs> All right, well, let's clap for both of our competitors. Woo! Woo! Of what they have presented to us so far. All right, next to the middle of the sidewalk, please welcome Francesca! Five, four, three, two, one. It's nearly September. I find it hard to remember the last- Louder, please. Louder. It's nearly September. I yeah. find it hard to remember the last time I saw you alive. Not a picture or a video, but a tangible thing. Something to touch, something to hold. I want to celebrate and rejoice and give thanks on this day. Two years removed, I didn't choose the same fate. I'm graduating this year and you are. I wish you could I wish you stayed a little longer and walked across the stage. When they announce your name, no one's gonna walk. Instead, we'll envision what it would be like when you, if you walked across that stage. It's nearly September, and I find it hard to remember. You once were a living thing, made of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, whatever else make, whatever the hell else makes up this fragile flesh. Not megabyte, not megabytes or gigabytes of the dust, compressed and transformed to live on a hard drive, a video to view whenever I. It's nearly September, and it's been a year since anyone's seen you alive. Broken at the seams in this fumbling machine, my brain fills with dopamine. Am I truly happy, or is this artificial? Laughter fills my body, my heart, and soul. Tripping and falling in joy, pupils dilate, and I'm ready to annihilate. This ghost that lives inside, lives in my mind, whispers, it's not worth it. There's a finite reasons to be happy, to, uh, to be unhappy, to hate life, but there's an infinite amount of reasons proving life's okay. Tomorrow's a better day. Yesterday was so shitty. God. It was so shitty. But the sun rose this morning and poked its head through the clouds, and that was all the reason I needed to believe that today will be a good day. How much time do I have?
underground wow. think until I can't think 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 I must theorize and analyze my thoughts into weights upon my shoulders think 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 myself into a hole I feel the weight of the world on my shoulders collapsing my lungs I can't breathe think 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 my makeup is a carbon but in truth of thoughts and obsessions a speck of dust weighing more than a 10 pound 10 pound ball Inhale anxiety, exhale even more anxiety. Thoughts holding the force of a feather blown away by the wind, a pebble, a pebble not causing a ripple in this tired lake of time. Past, present, Spencer. future stand steadily in this place. To what avail? I cannot erase better to stand than to shake in this place. Thank you. Woo! going to do another coin flip to determine who goes first in our third and final round. Um, since Francesca called it last time, Kristen gets to call it this time. I'm a fan of tails. Alrighty. It is heads. Alright. Francesca, would you rather go first or second? Alright. Let's give it up for Kristen! Uh, Alright. This is a four minute round. I have two poems this time, guys. Five, four, three, two, one, go. A storm is pulling the waves up over my head. My whole body flips over, the sand scrapes my knees, and salt fills the craters of my cheeks where the words used to be. My mother is waiting by the shore with a clean towel held open and eyes weighed down by worry. Those wrinkles are strained bridges connecting her eyes to her brows. I know the look well. Right after I was born, lifted from the sea of mommy's belly, my lung collapsed or, or filled with water. Maybe when we separated, I took too much of her with me. My whole being formed around years of words she ushered to the back of her mind, fell to the pit of her stomach. Of course, I couldn't hold the weight. If you curled me up, I was no bigger than her heart. I hear her heart beating as I struggle to shore. The storm rolls closer and sand scatters in the wind. I can't see her, but when I pull back the curtain of ports and field spar, I see the daisies from her garden, the time I plucked them from the soil, roots still dangling from the tip. I collected two handfuls, tied, to the, tied them together with a scrunchie, and held them up to her, showed her how much I love my mom. She smiled with sealed lips, didn't have the heart to tell me what I did wrong. When I opened my mouth to squeal, sand grinds up my gums, lodges between my teeth, salt water clogs my throat. Mom once told me to swim parallel to shore if I get pulled out to sea. She said it in the pocket of air that burst from her lungs the time Dad's fists turned metal frying pan. He threw kitchenware grenades, but her shrieks were the timely explosions. I can't hear them now. The water is filling my ears. I open my mouth and see bubbles float to the surface. There, I have my words, and somewhere in the enveloping ocean are messages corked into bottles that belong to my mom. Lightning cracks, and I know the storm has fermented enough for a burning taste. One of my four brothers told me mom cried tears of joy when I was born. Her drops of salt water rest on my tongue. They taste like her laugh and sound like my voice pine trees. We're all too cowardly to admit we want Grammy to die soon. Relief, which smells like the pine of a wooden casket, should only burn our lungs after the funeral. And until then, we can satisfy our hunger with the tension building along our jawlines. The taste reminds me of the first Thanksgiving Grammy spent in the nursing home. Mom burnt the turkey and black chars clung to my gums. When I talk about filling the knots of my lips with Grammy's scolding words, her rouge-colored lipstick, mom presses her whole hand to her mouth, orders me to scrub that shit from my lips with a bar of soap and forgiveness from the Lord. Half mercy, half, you should have known better. And while I'm at it, scrub the words heaven and desire and sanity from the creases of my mind where Grammy's dementia will fit me so perfectly. 
The red blood cells delivering oxygen to my lungs mingle with some measure of Grammy's blood and her great aunt Martha's blood and the blood of the Dutch girl who crossed the Atlantic. And that's all we know about her. And she crossed this great mass of water because here we all are on her land drowning. We carry her genetics and let them weigh down our bones. Watch her children sink closer to the ground with each tree branch they inherit. But even if the wind scrubbed clean the initials carved in the wood, there would still be the roots, like grapes, sprouting from the soil. They look like my mother's tangled hair, the tumor in her liver. There are families of birds nesting in my lungs. Sometimes when I gasp for air, I hear them singing for help. When I open my mouth to speak, Ten seconds. I taste salt water and the residue of Grammy's Rouge on my lips. Francesca. So please give it up for her again. Woo! Part of the poem. It is, <laughs> yes. But if I say sorry for saying sorry so much, it kind of undoes the sorry. I truly, really, honest and for true, I am sorry. I'm sorry my initial response to when you yelled at me for stop saying sorry was, I'm sorry. I panicked and the only two words resting on my tongue were, I'm and sorry. Most of the time I'm stuck in a gray vine and I don't know if, I, if some, if some, I don't know if something I've done was wrong or not. I don't know what to do. A heavy feeling grows in my stomach and I yell out, I'm sorry. And the feelings and the feeling begins to go away. At times it's ridiculous. Oh, I breathe in your direction again. I'm sorry it won't happen again. Maybe you dropped your paper and I apologize because you dropped it. No one knows the real reason why I constantly apologize. I don't even know why. Do I just overthink everything? Maybe. Is it some weird lack of self-confidence thing? I plead the fifth. Or do I do I fear that I apologize so much that when I need to apologize it will lessen the meaning of, of my apology and will no longer be taken seriously? You bet. On that note, I'm sorry. <laughs> The rapid intermission of this fine pitch, I listen to your heartbeat, I listen as your voice as you tell, I listen, I listen to your tender voice and hope, so please listen, come near to me. This song ends, the moment passes, the sound of your heartbeat, my steady staple, standing in those rocky waves, ammunition, fueled by, fueled by my anxiety, you're alive, I'm alive, we're alive, moonlight, our only light, this pitch black night, I listen to your voice, please listen, you might hear me say, I love you. I'm going to read this one even though I don't want to. Maybe you live, maybe you'll die, maybe you'll thrive, maybe you'll roll your dice, no matter what, keep your fight. Cancer isn't something that's touched once and decided to leave. The bitch took up residence a few times, took off her coat, placed it in the closet, and thought she'd be safe here, here, in your body. Little did she know she wasn't safe at all. The person she chose to reside in wouldn't back down. Well, that bitch better open the closet, put her coat back on, and walk out the door. Listen, cancer may take away your hair, your good health, your energy, and for a short time, your smile. Not to mention your left kidney. There's something it can never take away, and that's your fight. Dear Cancer, hear the, heed this warning. It won't be pretty for you, so kindly F off or tell the pain. Dear Mom, you're a tiger. As soon as you're hooked up on that ivy pool, ready for battle. A tiger ready. A tiger attacking her prey. <laughs> but there's a twist this time. Pray 
it's cancer. I love you, Mom. Go. Exactly. So I'm trying to think of how I can formulate it to this year. Gotcha. I actually don't like battle. Nothing against what you guys are doing because I shouldn't have to tear no one down. To be, to be well, these two didn't tear anyone down. I know, down. I know, and that's the beauty of this, this right here. So it's like a passive challenge type of thing. But I do uh, poetic nights at uh, the Monroe Community Center, which is located at 2000 Third Street, um, Northeast. Every Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Monday night is an odd night. No one's doing anything except for watching football. So come down to the poetry and no football. So afterwards. Or Which one's the location again? 2000. <laughs> 7 to 9. 7 to 9 on Monday. Monday. Every Monday? Yes, ma'am. And where's the Monroe Community Center, 2000 Third Street. Northeast. Thank you. It's right on the corner of 3rd and Monroe. To have anyone, it's the house of expression. I think expression should be universal. I mean, positive, as long as it has a good message, or you can just get it out and express yourself because if it's not heard, what is it? Thanks for having me. Thank you, Thank you very much for judging this evening. 
Thank you again. All right. Well, we should give a round of applause to all of our, all three of our judges. Because without them, a competition would be very difficult. It would be an open mic. Yes. That's right. All right. So Azrael is going to come up here and tell us about how the scoring went down and who is the winner and, you know, stuff like that. Give it up for us. So, the reason that took so long, it was because the math was very close on this one. So, if our two ladies would like to stand up. <laughs> All right. So the score, it was a split decision, and the decision had to go to the amount of points in the actual score, because the scores were 28, 29, 29, 27, and 28, 28. So they tied in one of by one judge. So the winner. And the closest sword fight we've had yet, by one little bitty point, little bitty point, Kristen Wurstler. <laughs> Kristen, would you like to say anything to You did anyone? wonderful. Oh, you did wonderful, and I really had fun going up against you. We'll have to talk afterward. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to our judges. Already said. <laughs> uh, so just thank you, everyone. Francesca, do you have anything to say? I'm very angry that that color looks really good on you. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> yes, yes. You did really good. I enjoyed your phone. Thank you. So we're gonna see you both back. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. All right. All right. So give it up again for our competitors. <laughs> Your flag is red, your flag is blue, your flag is white, and so are you. Placed atop your concessions truck, you have just made a political statement at this so-called family event. So when you shout at me as a coward in the distance that my politics have no place here, may I remind you that flag on your truck is a political statement. The American flag is not a benign symbol. It is the authoritarian reinforcement of a jingoistic value system that demonizes the other and up, uplifts the privilege of the white male, whom you just happen to be, sitting in your truck, shouting at me as a coward in the distance, trying to silence a dissenting voice, because your flag is your politics. And you support the system that I speak out against. If gun control and civil rights are words that children's ears should never hear, and gun violence, slavery, discrimination, and segregation are even greater crimes against our children. Silence will not end the injustice, and waiting for an allegedly appropriate hour to speak only results in delays and deference. Tools the white man uses to hold everyone else down, tone policing anger, calling out demonstrations at public events inappropriate. If now is not the time to discuss my civil rights, then when is? When does this marginalized, marginalized citizen's mere existence stop being political long enough to have a proper conversation about my rights? It doesn't. So I will stand here and speak my piece for children's ears to hear, because it's only then will my voice carry weight. 
For when your children learn of the injustices you've allowed in the name of preserving white America, they will learn what we have always known, that your flag is a tool of the oppression we face every single day living under it, and the promises this nation makes to your children, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every last word of that is a lie, and the flag that sits upon your truck is reinforcement of that lie. I will not protect your lies for the sake of your children. I will speak the truth to power for every child in this nation to hear because they deserve to be told the truth about you, about the flag that sits upon your truck, about the political statement that you wave in my face to oppress and silence me when I take whatever mine should be here. This is no longer a family event. It is an educational seminar about the real America, the America that is red and yellow and brown and black and covered in rainbows, the America that your flag doesn't represent. Your flag drips with red blood on the hands of white skin, burying the shameful blue underneath its white stars. And I will not stand silent in the face of your political statement any longer. Summerland. Months and months on end of heat and isolation. Humidity has a way of clouding up your brain and I'm still here just dragging through the endless days. My only friends are the sounds that come from radio. These smashing pumpkin songs are the only things keeping me sane. I want to die every single day in Summerland. I try to drown myself in the local pool when no one's there. It turns out that people will float long before they sink. If you want to die, you actually have to try. No one ever dies when you stand on the still. I just met a girl who went to Summerland. I would miss her every day, but she never called or felt the same. Humidity has a way of clouding up your brain, and I'm still here, just dragging through the endless days. My only friends were Beavis, Butthead, and the X-Men. These cartoons were the only things keeping me sane. I hate the days living here in Summerland. I stay inside where air-conditioned bliss keeps heat away. Turns out that normal people think you're weird when you choose comfort over pain. No one ever lives by standing still. I just can't wait for fall, for schools and milder weather, when I am finally real again, not lost here in Summerland. Humidity has given away to falling tree leaves, and I am finally here where someone else sees me. Maybe now I can make some friends who will stick around who won't all disappear on me once Summerland comes back to town. Woo. Just makes you sick. But John, what turns my stomach 
It's judgment passed on people whose lives you do not know. Precious few people qualify for social security disability, but those who desperately need it. And even then, they can't get married. Disability disappears when lovebirds go legit. The first of the month is also the day for pensions and other retirement income. They went to work every day, so they would have this now. Makes me sick. I would like to retire someday without protestations of how lazy I must be. Not to mention how many people both receive some kind of assistance and work as much as they can. Partial disability exists. Your attitude is easier to get than money to raise up against physical and mental illness. Our safety net has hit the iceberg and you're deciding who deserves a life vest. And John, that makes me sick. I am breaking up with your ideas, which was more of a planned arranged marriage. Go sicken people who want your toxic sludge, but care for you. title pencil that Skylark was talking about. So in January 19th, the day after my birthday, we're going to have a tournament to, uh, Can I touch it? if you want to touch my wood. I'm sorry, you're so okay. That's gross. Oh, uh, <laughs> I apologize. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> I did it right in front of your parents, too. That's gross. Okay. All right. I'm actually here a little bit of the poems I have, but I'm not going to read them. Um, all right, so I've got two pieces. First one is adorable. It's called Outrun Your Shadow. I watched a little girl stand against the wall. She looked down at the ground with her foot out on the wall and jumped forward towards the wall in front of her. I watched her small sprints from wall to wall trying to figure out what she was doing she wasn't smiling, she was concentrating. I followed her eyes to the floor. Are you trying to outrun your shadow? Mm-hmm. Have you done it yet? Mm-hmm. Lost the ability to turn my page. Huh. Maybe you should try distracting it. There are actually two. She pointed to the other shadow to her left. Which do you think is faster? The one over here. I meet thousands of people every first Friday. We do this thing on our gallery space, add a line of poetry. We set a theme for the month and ask people who pass, would you like to add a line to our group poem about insert theme here? We get our lines filled generally, but most people give us a look akin to deer in headlights. They stutter and say, I'm okay, or I'm good, or I'm not witty, or I'm not any good with words, or I won't be good, or I'm not a poet. Who told these people they aren't poets? Who told them they can't create? Who told them to stop trying to outrun their shadow? This isn't good. We are all artists as children until someone tells us we are not. We are balls of energy, small sprints, bouncing between walls. At the end of the night, I asked the little girl, did you outrun your shadow? Yes. Yeah. This piece is not adorable. How many of you here like diabetes? It's sweet. Sweet. Thank you. The anticipation consumes me before sugar ever hits my lips. I know well the smell of baked goods, the lashing of my tongue by granulated goodness, the pure caning of my taste buds by the oncoming sweetness. All my life, I've known when something was going to be too sweet, but like a slave, I was chained to its consumption. No, not a slave. I had a choice. I made the choice. I took in every bite with relish or ketchup in disgust, but I ate it all. I ate too much. 
all the time. I made the choice. As a child, maybe I didn't know my any better. My brother gorged himself, so I thought I could too, and I did. I had fell asleep after big meals like the men in my family. I thought that was normal. There was much less information back then to begin with. And as a child, I had the least of it. And as a child, I had the most trust for people who didn't know what was best for me, but tried, at least in some cases. I've been getting high on fructose for as long as I can remember. And my dealers were my family. It's true. You shouldn't get high on your own supply. The sugar crosses my lips, tongue, down my throat, hits my stomach. I've always had a stomach that can stand anything. Hot food, mass amounts, give me anything except lima beans, weirdly enough. No discomfort, no vomiting. Combine a cast iron stomach with revulsion towards wasting food, and you've got a recipe for a fat aster. I've always been fat. Other than a few extra layers and twice the density, I look like I did when I wrestled 112 pounds in high school. I've had a dad bod since before the term was in vogue, long before I was old enough to be, be a dad. The sugar collects in my body. My pancreas fights for its life inside me, producing or possibly overburdening itself. A sponge squeezed and re-squeezed until there is no liquid left then squeezed again until it is a dry husk of an organ. At least that's the progression. My kidneys don't know how to process the urea and have become damaged, spewing protein like an oil pipeline. My body is a disaster area, a terrorist aftermath, and my life is the resistance to it. Thank you. Anyone else who wanted to read during the reported open mic? Yeah. All right, Kara, yeah. come how, on up. How many? A couple. A couple. Are you good? Yes, they're yeah, shorter. Sure. Yeah. I'm a fighter. My goal is to stand in the ring victorious. My opponent is bigger and stronger than I. Winning this battle is almost impossible, but I refuse to give up. I'm putting on my hot pink boxing gloves and facing my opponent, ready to swing. Each round I will battle with all my might, punching and blocking and kicking and screaming. I will fight as blood pours down my face. I will kick and punch as hard as I can. At times I'll get sucker punched right in the face. Every punch will hurt. I will feel every blow and sometimes I will get knocked out. And if I lay flat face in the boxing ring while the referee counts one, two, three, four, don't count me out until the referee says ten. I may just rise ready to fight again. about my mom. Mom, you dislike him. Mom, you dislike him. No, you hate